Hello, my brothers and sisters, and God bless and be with you once again. It's very good to be with you on this beautiful evening. Uh, my name is Father Bob Miller, pastor of St. Dorothy Church on the south side of Chicago. It's a joy to be with you in this beautiful uh, kind of sister church of ours, St. Columbanus, as we share good news with you tonight. Uh, it's my privilege to share some good news that's hopeful, that gives hope to the dark world that we live in. And as you know well, we don't have our hope in the things. It's not what we possess. It's not what we have. It's who we have. It's the power of God in our life and the presence of Jesus Christ in our life that transforms us and gives us hope to keep on keeping on. I want to start with a scripture passage as I've been doing in these, this series so far, trying to encourage all Catholics to read scripture we Catholics are a Bible-based church. We need to be in contact with the Word of God to read it, to pray it, to study it, and know it well. I want to read a passage today from the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel as we start. 13th verse. Now when Jesus came into the districts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, Still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I read a story um, a while back from a priest, many of you may have heard of, Father Anthony DeMello. And uh, Father DeMello told a story about a man who converted. And he became a Christian, a believer, and his life changed in a very dramatic way and how he acted and how he talked changed. Well, one day he ran across an old friend of his who had known him previously. And the man was a skeptic and kind of a cynic. So he's questioning, he says, oh, so you had a conversion, how huh? you've changed. Huh? Said, yes, ma'am. Yes. He said, I've, I've had a true change. I know Jesus in a special way. He says, well, tell me about this Jesus. I mean, uh, uh, how long did he live? How long was he on earth? The man says, I don't know. I haven't read everything I should be. Well, um, tell me what his teaching was in a nutshell. Can you summarize it in two minutes or less? The man says, well, I'll try, but I'm not very good. Uh, how many people did he touch? He asked all these questions. And finally, his answers were dissatisfied. So I finally told the man, listen, for somebody who converted to Jesus, you don't seem to know a whole lot about him. And the man humbly said, yes, sir, you're right. I, I don't know enough about this man. I, I don't know as much as I should, but I do know this. He forgave me. He turned my life around. He brought me back to my wife to ask forgiveness, and our marriage is now back together. He brought my children back to me and transformed our relationship. I have a job back because I was humble enough to move out of my sinful behavior and change my lifestyle. My life is different, and I know where I'm going in heaven. So yes, my life has changed. That's the story I would leave with you today. Change. What has Jesus Christ done in your life? To me, phrase it differently. How would your life be different if you didn't know Jesus Christ? Christ. That's what I want to talk about today. In this series, I've been talking about how our hope lies in our God, who has three faces, the God of mercy and anchoring love of the Father, the spirit of passion, and today I want to talk a little bit about the power of Jesus, liberating salvation. Just who is this man, Jesus? He has transformed the world, hasn't he? In 2,000 years, so many things are different. This man is the most influential person ever set foot on the face of this earth, touched millions of lives, countless lives. Nations have been started because of him. Wars have been fought because of him. Who is this man? That's the question that was asked today, and that's the question I want to ask all of us today. Who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus Christ? Because someday, we're going to have to hear that question again. It's going to be the last day of our life. Now, why do we need to focus on Jesus for just a moment? Here's, I think, today what's happened, especially here in America. I think we've lost our focus. 
nominally we are a Christian country, but I, I think, and it's just my opinion, that maybe we've gotten jaded. That this message of Jesus has lost its ability to shock us. It's lost its ability to, to touch us in our deep and, and challenging places. I mean, it's lost its radicalness for us. We've heard it before. Forgive your enemies. Oh, yeah, I've heard that. Love everybody. Yeah, I heard that too. Give your way to the poor. Yeah, I've heard that before. So what's happened, I'm afraid, to our Christian message sometimes, especially for we who are church goes, it's been ritualized and institutionalized. We've broken up into nice manageable little chunks, and sometimes we've lost the fire. And if I can say a word to my, my fellow ministers, I think sometimes we professional church people are the worst because we have it all here in our head. We know about Jesus. We don't know Jesus. And that's what Jesus came to talk about today. Is I came to light a fire on the earth to set the world on fire and how I wish it were burning. So let's just share for a moment, if you could, let's just reflect, what's this message that Jesus brings? The fullness of the message of what Jesus Christ brings, the full gospel, so to speak. Um, I used to belong to a religious order called the Redemptorist, my dear brothers, and uh, their motto was copioso apod eum redemptio. With him is the fullness of redemption. Let's talk about that. Three things that Jesus brings that we desperately need in our world. Number one, Jesus Christ is about salvation. Romans 10 says, whoever calls and the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation, that's the first message of what Jesus Christ brings to us. Now, if you're a Christian, if you're a Catholic as I am, you might say, well, yeah, we've heard this before, and talking about salvation and whether we're saved, this sounds something like you'd hear more like in a, in a Baptist church or a fundamentalist church. My friends, I want to propose to you something. Catholics need to be saved too. <laughs> we need salvation. Salvation is simply a matter of getting to heaven by knowing God. We need to know the Lord in a powerful way in our life. So that's my reflection today is how do we get saved? The Bible says that we work out our salvation in fear and trembling. We need to be, con be connected to what Jesus brings. Now, can I offer a suggestion? Um, how, what is salvation for us in our Christ, Christian Catholic context? Very simple explanation. I think there's a passive element and there's an active element. On a passive level, there's nothing you can do to earn heaven. You can't earn it, can't buy it, can't pay for it. You can say rosaries all day long, go to mass three times a day. That alone does not get you in heaven. It is a free gift of the Lord. What does 1 John 4 say? This is what love is. Not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us first. Salvation is a gift. It's a free gift from God that he offers to us. A real quick story to, that makes it very real to me. When I was in my seminary days, we had a walk-in freezer. And at the end of our meals, all the food we put in a walk-in freezer and locked up so we couldn't eat it at night. Well, a locked freezer is no problem for seminarians who have tools. And one night, they'd been working outside, four of my classmates were working shoveling snow. It's 2.30 in the morning. They're starving. The food's locked up. But they know it's locked. They bring all their tools, and they proceed to take every single screw out of the frame that holds the door of the walk-in freezer. Every single screw. Dozens and dozens. They had a big pile of screws, and they were going to pull the whole frame out to get in to get the food. So they get all the screws on a big pile, they grab on the frame, and they're gonna pull the whole thing out. Somebody accidentally grabs the door to get a handle and pulls it, the door opens. It had never been locked that day. My friends, that's salvation. We're so busy taking out the screws, God says, I love you, accept my love into your life. That's passive. The other aspect of salvation is act. We need to make a choice for God in our life. We do have to accept what God has given us. It's much like if I were to hand you a gift. I would say, here's the gift. You have to reach out and what? Take the gift. We have to receive the gift and then let it change our lives. That's the active aspect of salvation for us too. That's what the Bible very clearly says. If you confess with your lips and believe with your heart that Jesus has died, you shall be saved. 
So my friends, I encourage you, if you've not said it in your heart, just make a conscious choice in your mind and simply say, His grace is sufficient for all my needs. So Jesus is about salvation. Second aspect of what Jesus is about for us that gives us hope is Jesus is about transformation. Transformation. John 10.10 10 says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. God comes into us. He changes us. He loves us just the way we are. But after a while, he says, you know, I'd like to do a few different things in your life. It's kind of like you invite a God into your house. And God makes himself comfortable and has a good time. After a couple weeks, God says, you know, I really like your house, but can I, can I move that couch a little bit? <laughs> can I change your bedroom around? That's what God does to our soul. He slowly begins to transform our lives and move us around. God did some amazing transformations for people, didn't he? Paul knocked off a horse. Peter jumping out of a boat. Mary saying yes. To, to, to God when she was asked to be pregnant without even being formally, technically married yet in the Jewish sense. So God truly transforms us through his Jesus on two levels. He transforms our self, our personal relationship. We are not the same. And that's what God does. The first words Jesus says were, remember the Gospel of Mark? Jesus comes, the very first words he says, turn away from sin, convert and believe in Jesus Christ. So the first message is a transformation of ourself, moving out of shame, out of fear, out of guilt, out of anger, out of resentment, out of greed, whatever holds us back, a personal transformation. But then the second transformation is a transformation of society. And I think we've gotten mixed up on this. Salvation is not just me and God. It's not just me being saved and the heck with the rest of the world. Very clearly in the Bible, salvation has an effect on the world around us. It must touch other people. And if you look at Jesus, his message really was a blessing for everyone. Jesus had a preferential option for the poor. He clearly reached out in Mary's Magnificat, it's a perfect example of that. He pulls down the hungry from the thrones and lifts up the lowly. So God wants us to take our faith and our salvation and make a difference in the world that you're in. And whatever little world that you're part of, make a difference in a better way by standing against attitudes of race-based thinking or fear or anger or resentment. Make a difference in the world. As, as, as Jesus said, you think I've come for peace, I've come for a division. In other words, I've come to make a change in the world that we live in. So that's the second aspect of Jesus. He transforms us. The third aspect of Jesus Christ that, that truly makes him the source of our life and our hope. Jesus Christ is about a conversion in values. How we look at the world and how we look at the values that shape our life completely changes. And I don't think I have to listen, talk to you about how the world we live in today is rather confused in its values, is it not? I mean, our, our values here in so many ways are out of order. Our, our, how do we respect life around us, for example? I've personally found it kind of amusing that we have all these laws now that we can't have Bible study, we can't talk about God in high school, but we can give out condoms. And there's all these shootings in our schools, but we can't talk about God. Something seems to be out of order to me personally. Maybe I'm wrong. Our values in this world are out of order as well. Uh, many of you have heard Matthew Kelly. And I, Matthew Kelly's books are very, very good. He sums this up beautifully. He says, there's three prevailing philosophies that go in our world today that dominate our modern culture. Number one is individualism. It's all about me. What's in it for me? That's number one attitude that prevails so much. Number two, hedonism. The supreme good is pleasure. If it feels good, do it. And the third value that dominates is minimalism. What's the least I can do to get the maximum out of it? And I think that sums up the values of the world so well. In and, and, and most of their lives, most people make their daily decisions in one of those three areas. So now let's take a look because Jesus Christ is about something different. 
Jesus Christ is about a complete transformation in how we live. Now, we will look a little different than the rest of the world, but I think Jesus said that. We have to stand out from the world. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of slander against you. We Christians have to stand out a little bit. We have to be a little different. Here's the three values that Jesus would offer in opposing the values of this world. Number one, the value of love. Love. How many times in Scripture can you count where Jesus talks about the power of love? What's the great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your spirit. Greater love than this. No one has that. He does what? Lay down his life for a friends. If, we do not, if I have faith to move the mountains, but I do not have love, you're familiar with that scripture. And there's the great story of the woman, the penitent woman in chapter 7 of Luke, who came washing his feet. And Jesus says to her, little is forgiven the one whose love is small. Love is a transforming power. What does it sound? There's a song that we sing a lot called, They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love. First transforming value that Jesus offers. Second value of Jesus, freedom. But true freedom. Not the freedom of this world, freedom from, but freedom to. Um, in Luke chapter 4, what does Jesus say? He has this description of what his whole life is going to be about. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. And what is it on him to do? It's on him to bring good news to the poor, liberty to captives, recovery of sight, a year of jubilee freedom. Jesus wants us to be free free from anything that holds us back from what he made us to be. Free him from fear, from shame, from guilt, from worry, from addictions, free from family issues. He wants us to be free. And that's what James says when he says, always act as men and women destined for freedom. So I pray that you can pray for the freedom to be set free from whatever holds you back to give yourself to the Lord. And third, last value that Jesus offers, truth. Truth. Uh, John has that great verse, you will know the truth and the truth will set us free. So one of the real keys of the spiritual journey is you have to face the truth in yourself before any real change happens. Invite the Lord in to truly make a change in our life. And here's where it gets hard, folks, because if you're like me, I have a little bit of stubbornness in me. How about you? I have a little bit of control. Heck, I have a lot of control. How about you? It's hard to let go and let God, and let God's truth speak truth to me. And that's truly what God's message does. His love transforms the world. His freedom gives us the true freedom, not the freedom of this world the freedom of God to know and love and serve Him and be filled with healing. And lastly, His truth sets us free. Let me just conclude with three perspectives here that, that may help you a little bit to stay in touch with this full gospel. What, what I've tried to share today in some weak way is, is what the full gospel of Jesus is. Three perspectives. Number one, every day sit quietly with God. Don't think, just ask. Just sit, sit quietly, stoke the fire of God in you. Sit quietly, just invite God in. Wherever you're going through right now, just sit quietly sometime tonight, sometime tomorrow, sit quietly before God. And just hear him speaking to you, those beautiful words, you are precious in my eyes and I love you. Spend quiet time with God. Number two, stay in the word of God. Read your Bible. I said this in the beginning, I want to return to this again. We have to read scripture, and, and as one great saint says, read slowly and chew on it. Literally, chew on it. Don't just read real quick, but spend some time on that verse. What does it mean? What is it saying to you? Chew on it. Let it speak to you in new ways. Get to know that book. Attend a Bible study if you're able to, but get to know the Word of God to truly fill you with life. And third and lastly, Pray for a new baptism in the Holy Spirit. Most of us, listen to me, right now have already been baptized. But right now I pray for a new baptism for you. 
a new fire, a new passion, a passion to know God, to love God, and to serve God so that Jesus Christ can truly be the anchor, the rock, the fortress, the deliverer of our life. Would you pray with me for a moment? Let's just bow our heads for a moment. And I'm going to ask you as you're listening to me to repeat this prayer after me. I'm going to read it slowly. Just wherever you are, just repeat this slowly to me as we pray again a renewal to Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I am sorry for my sins. I thank you for dying on the cross for me personally. I celebrate your resurrection on this beautiful day. I give my life to you now. I invite you into my life completely. Come into my home. Come into my business. Come into my school. Come into my family. Come into my recreation. Come wherever I am. Lord Jesus, I truly accept you as my Lord, my God, and my personal Savior. Come now, Lord, and fill me with your love. Fill me, Lord Jesus, with your Holy Spirit. Fill me, Lord, with your joy. And then send me forth. Send me to my family. Send me to my friends to share with them your love and your concern. Jesus, I love you, and I will follow you at your disciple every day for the rest of my life. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great night. If you have good news, we expect you to want to share it. Salvation in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who for love of us and for our salvation came down from heaven. Salvation in His name, and He is the only Savior, is what we are on earth for. Therefore, all those who spread the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, we should encourage them. I can speak, but how many people can I reach alone? But the media, the television people, the radio, the newspapers, and all those who use the computer and its derivatives in various ways to spread the gospel. We must thank them. We must encourage them. We must work with them so that they can continue to spread the good news. There is so much news that is not so wonderful in the world, but there is also news that is wonderful on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We encourage them and beg God to bless them especially the Shalom World TV. God bless you. Shalom World, God's own channel.